And we are back from break on the InfoWars Nightly News. We are joined now by a very important and interesting guest, Dr. Mayer Eisenstein. Uh, he holds a medical doctor degree as well as a law degree, and he's the medical director of Home First Health Services. He's written many books. We carry at least one of them, Don't Vaccinate Before You Educate, available at InfoWars.com. Dr. Eisenstein, thank you for joining us. I know that a, a large percentage of your listening audience already has decided they don't want to vaccinate. So this afternoon, I'd like to talk about how you can write a valid legal waiver, be it for your child or be it for yourself. Right. Uh, so do you want to get into that first or cover some of the things happening in the news? Oh, I'd love to get that first because I think that's really uh, – that. that that, you know, as we're getting close to school physical year, you know, this becomes an issue with, with millions and millions of, of families. And I want to start by saying that this Sunday night at uh, 7 o'clock at night, that's uh, East, uh, Central Time, I will be having a complimentary webinar, webinar how to write a legal waiver for vaccines. Um, all you have to do is go to our website, homefirst.com, that's H-O-M-E-F-I-R-S-T.com. You hit the webinar button, and you just put your email address, and you can sign up. Or you can give um, my office a call at 866-395-1881. That's 866-395-1881. You can sign up for the uh, webinar, and I intend to answer everyone's question who calls because I find this kind of really important because I also like to get the pulse of what the public, what are their questions, what are their concerns when it comes to the whole vaccine issue. Okay, doctor, yeah, just please elaborate. Okay, good. You know, uh, if you could put the slides up, you know, uh, let's see, can I see the slides or, um, what, that are going up? Because uh, I have a couple of them that I'm going to use on Sunday night. Um, let's see if I can see them. Uh, otherwise, I can uh, I could just start talking about that and we can, uh, um, well, I, I've been very proud that um, I've been the uh, the medical director for Home First Health Services. I've had 15 physicians work with me over the years, and we have delivered not only 15,000 children, almost all of them at home, but also we have more than 40,000 children who are not vaccinated. And uh, what makes this so unique is that we have virtually no uh, allergies, ADD, ADHD, virtually no diabetes, and virtually no autism. Is this related to the vaccines? Well, I'm sure there's a large percentage of that that's related, you know, but I'd like other people to say why we have such a large population, um, and you would expect in this population at least 400 children with autism-like symptoms, about 2,000 uh, with uh, learning disorders, and more than 4,000 with allergies. It runs about 10%. And yet we have virtually none. And uh, it, it seems that the correlation is very strong. Now, that wasn't the reason why I got involved with this. I, I'm a student with the late Dr. Robert Mendelson, and he was the National Medical Director of Head Start. And Dr. Mendelson came to the conclusion um, over 40 years ago, because my oldest son is 40 years old now, that that there was not a single vaccine that ever came out that ever made any difference as far as the population w went for healthcare. And so slowly but surely, from the early 1970s when I met him, um, uh, he started realizing that the vaccines weren't only uh, helpful, but they could have been very dangerous. And 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 not, now we have some graphs actually put out by the Center for Disease Control. And if we can show the the first graph here, and I'm I'm looking at a picture of myself here, and and that is. Um, uh, you take a look, it looks like these little squiggly lines. It says U United States mortality rates. A and what you see is uh, lines that um, death rate, starting from 1900 and going all the way up to almost 1970. And you could see that the death rate of all these diseases seemed to be parallel as far as they were going away. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating about this, if you look at this graph, is there was no vaccine for scarlet fever. There's no vaccine for typhoid, and so, and yet these vac these diseases disappeared at the very same rate. And if you go to the second the graph, of sanitation, right? 
Well, you, you, you can make an argument. You know that that's that's an argument. You know sanitation. You know, uh, but you, it's very difficult to make an argument. And when I went to public health school, I endlessly argued with the professors who would show these graphs, and then they would say vaccines. I said, but your own graphs show that vaccines had no impact on this. And then you take a look at the next one, which is maybe the most striking one, is you take a look at tuberculosis, because tuberculosis in the 1900s was one of the largest causes of death in this country and in the world, and it's virtually disappeared. There is a vaccine for tuberculosis. It's given in Europe, but it's not given here, and tuberculosis virtually doesn't exist. And so, you know, I, I, I think what's, what's critical is that we have to take a look at um, – uh, why this is happening, and what has the whole vaccine program be, been about? And the third graph that I, I brought here today was one of showing the flu vaccine. And if you take a look, that the death rate from flu continues to go up since 1980, and it goes up almost directly with the percentage of people receiving the flu vaccine. Now, yeah. I, don't want to, I don't want anyone to say that the flu vaccine is causing a death. It's, it's a possibility. It's one of the thoughts. Uh, but surely it has to be addressed, and this goes along with correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. But the bottom line is that there's never ever been any evidence that flu vaccine has done anything, and yet we 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 have year after year. The biggest problem I have as an attorney, helping nurses to be able to and healthcare workers, is the attempt at mandates that they won't let them work unless they take a flu vaccine. Yet there's zero evidence that this vaccine does any good. In fact, we have some evidence that it may actually cause harm. And of course, in 2009, when we had the big H1N1 scare and they hurried to rush the vaccine, we had Wolfgang Rodarg of the European Parliament uh, come forward and say it was just a big scandal that they elevated uh, the hoax, you know, without good cause, basically just to sell vaccines at a minimum and perhaps to do introduce even more dangerous things. Uh, you're 100 percent right, you know, and, and I think that uh, if you take a look at business wise, every one of the major pharmaceutical companies in the last five years has developed, has bought or developed their own vaccine tract. And there's more than 200 vaccines in the hopper because this is a windfall profit. Can you imagine having a product which you can give to everyone, sick or non sick, young or old? It doesn't work. And next year you give it again. I mean, that's the flu vaccine more than anything else and and that may be one of the strongest arguments as to the ridiculousness of this whole of vaccine program you know it's like they have to stand on the leg of their weakest component and without a doubt the flu vaccine is the weakest component uh, but you know, well, go ahead. please no go go ahead please well, i just want to bring up the larger issue of the great the great awakening among parents and individuals who don't want to be vaccinated as you realize that at a minimum, this is very corrupt, uh, politically driven science, and it's almost at a barbaric level. I mean, of course people are going to say no when they begin to inform themselves to find out about this stuff. I think you're absolutely right. I could tell you that as a practicing physician for almost 40 years, uh, I never imagined that uh, we would reach a point where millions and millions of people reject vaccines. You know, I, I find it incredible. You know, uh, I, I, it, it's almost mind boggling. It really speaks to the will and testament of the public who are willing to put themselves at great uh, detriment uh, in order to do what's right. And this is very exciting, you know, very, very exciting. I mean, that's that's why I believe that this country will survive no matter what, no matter what type of uh, abusive administrations we have, because um, uh, we still do have a constitution, even though I know lots of the uh, people in the present administration don't think so and they would like to get rid of it. Uh, but I, I, I believe we'll, we'll triumph uh, uh, over that. Uh, and and there, it's kind of ties in so nicely the whole concept of a constitutional rights and, and the whole issue of vaccines. And yeah. I'd like to spend about five minutes on that and if you can put up the slide of um, which which has got a scroll of the constitution you know um and um vaccine exemptions it's exert ex an excerpt from my book the one that you that you carry at infowars and i just want to read the uh first amendment uh um 
and you'll have it there on the screen right now. Uh, this protects our right to refuse vaccines. The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law res respect respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You know, and, and uh, of course, it's got free speech there, but th that's the part of the law that gives us the strength and the ability to refuse vaccines. And I'm going to spend a few minutes today here, but I'm going to spend an enormous amount of time Sunday night because uh, I think it's important for everyone in the public to understand this who wants to uh, get a legitimate waiver for vaccines. And, and if you look at the next slide here, the vaccine waivers, there's three ways which you legally can avoid vaccines. Uh, one is medical, and all 50 states accept that. The second one is philosophical, and which means you just say, I don't want to. 18 states currently uh, accept that, including Texas. Texas, California, Wisconsin are philosophical exemption states. Uh, and for a long time, I would uh, uh, lobby in favor of trying to get all the states to be philosophical exemption states. But I decided that was a wrong position. And the reason I decided it was wrong is because uh, something that's made by a legislature, and by the way, all vaccines are, are state mandated, can be overturned one day. So let's say you live in Texas and you decide that you want to send your children to school and you don't want to vaccinate them and you write a philosophical exemption which just says, uh, I don't want to vaccinate my child. And that, that's, you know, you may want to put it a little bit better, but that's all you really legally technically need. And then all of a sudden, Texas legislature changes the law. Oh my God, you're in problem now. Now you have to say, oops, uh, it wasn't that, it's something else. And by the way, the medical exemption won't work because every state has written into their state statutes that if you, um, um, if you use a medical waiver, they have a right to send you to another doctor to decide if the waiver is correct. I'm, I'm presently involved in a legal case here in Illinois, uh, exactly that, where they're refusing the medical waiver and they're saying that they won't take care of this child who needs a surgical procedure, even though the surgeon has already agreed that the vaccines have nothing to do with the surgery and the child's had no harm because of that. But the pediatrician, the head of pediatrics at the hospital said, we will not allow this child to have um, uh, the surgery uh, until he gets vaccinated and we will, I will not accept a medical um, uh, reason unless you give it to me and I will be the one who will decide if it's legitimate or not. Incredible. Well, about the, and the only legitimate, Dr. Mendelssohn used to say that, that uh, the only legitimate uh, 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 medical exemption, and even that is after the person's dead, and even that they, they most probably believe you should be vaccinated. And so uh, then the third one is a religious exemption. And interesting enough, two states, Mississippi and West Virginia, um, uh, don't uh, uh, believe in a religious uh, waiver, which means they essentially are in violation of the Constitution. It's a serious problem, you know, but once again, it's a big fight. And, uh, and what you learn in the law is that you may be right, uh, but it doesn't help you. And what we learned in law school, which is great, you know, the good lawyer knows the law, the better lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> and I think that that's most probably speaks more uh, uh, for for law. But I now believe everyone should do a religious waiver, you know, um, and uh, the law speaks very well to that. And I'll be speaking about that uh, Sunday night. And, um, and, and because that's a constitutional right that's very difficult to take away, uh, away with. Well, doctor, does I, that hold up for people who don't have a, uh, uh, an official religious affiliation? Exactly right. You know, I mean, you're asking the absolutely perfect question, you know, uh, and if, if, let's just quickly look at the next slide, then I'll address that right away. If we take a look at the slide of the United States, it's got a list of all the states, and on the uh, lower left-hand side, there's a... Um, um, it shows you which states believe in religious exemption, which one believes in uh, medical exemption. And, and there are many websites where you can look up all, uh, all the law, but, that, but it's, unless you live in West Virginia or Mississippi, there's not a problem. So the question you ask is a perfect question. Uh, what's if I'm not a Christian scientist? What's if I'm not Amish? Uh, what is my... Um, 
role when it comes to uh, uh, how do I write a religious uh, a waiver. And this was addressed in 1987 in New York by the Wexler Court. And what they said is there is they, they, they felt that the person has a right for a personal religious belief, you know, and, and that's now being held up by 48 states, uh, except once again, West Virginia, Mississippi, have accepted the Wexler Court's decision. And what does it mean accepted it? A, a state court like New York doesn't have any jurisdiction in a court in uh, California, Texas, um, uh, but the, the, the courts will look to other states and what their Supreme Courts have said. To, to uh, It's not precedent, but it'll help them decide what they're going to do. And so what the Wexler Court held was that um, there were two prongs uh, to it. If it was you were either part of an established religion or it was personal and personal meant it was your specific personal belief and it's kind of interesting i i learned this in, med in law school actually i loved law school Funny thing, i didn't like medical school until i met dr mendelson and i thank god every day for being able to practice medicine i enjoyed immensely i loved law school absolutely loved law school you know but I didn't find anything in law that interests me whatsoever but of course i'm excited to be able to help with this whole vaccine issue it is a very important aspect and there's what's exciting is there's lawyers around the country now uh, there's uh, patty finn there's there's uh, Alan Phillips, there's Mary Holland, phenomenal constitutional lawyers who are helping families all around the country uh, with vaccine uh, uh, waivers. Uh, the second thing that happened here uh, uh, was in Wyoming in 2001, where they upheld uh, that, uh, that it, the, the First Amendment right of freedom of religion could not be um, uh, changed by the state courts. Obviously, that the, the, state, the states cannot... Um, uh, uh, su uh, be superior, supreme to the Constitution. But even more, the important thing of the Wyoming court was that they said that you couldn't do a religious inquiry. You couldn't start harassing someone how sincere uh, their, their belief um, uh, is. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of exciting because what the court said was that a lot of people, when they're younger, have one belief. And then as you get older, you have uh, uh, other beliefs. And, and that's kind of like a, a little bit of an introduction. And what we'll do is on Sunday night, I'll go very specifically into how to write the waiver, the religious waiver. You don't need a rabbi, a priest or a minister. Um, uh, you don't have to join a Christian Science Church or an Amish uh, Church. Uh, every person in this country can do it, uh, and I'll show them how. And, and by the way, it's it's my the question is: Is this a sham? Is this? A, and, I, and I don't like sham. I only because I think if you could do something legitimate, you stay on the legitimate track. The bottom line is: w w uh, Every one of us who questions vaccines doesn't really have. I don't care if we're a layperson, a doctor, really. 100% know if we're right or wrong. But in our heart, we know that this is wrong. And what does it mean in our heart? That's essentially a religious belief. And so I think the religious belief is exactly the reason why virtually everyone doesn't believe in vaccines. And that's why it's important when you write this religious waiver that you don't go into medical talk. Vaccines are dangerous. There's mercury in vaccines. There's fetal tissues in vaccines that cause harm because that now crosses over to be a medical waiver. And the goal here is for a religious waiver. And essentially, very quickly, a religious waiver means in my heart, I don't believe God intends me to do this. Well, is it not central to the whole basis of natural law and the idea that no state power can even begin to presume it's above God, no matter what kind of belief you hold? I mean, it's a personal issue. It always has been. It's central to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the preamble of the Constitution. Oh, my God, you're so right. You're so on point, you know. Uh, and and what, what, what they try to do is say for the better interest of the country, the better interest of the state. But th that's why I showed in the beginning uh, the graphs showing that it's a questionable argument if any vaccine has ever been in the best interest of the state. You know, it's the illusion. You know, it, it's become almost a knee-jerk reaction. Disease, vaccine. In fact, all these movies that you see over the last 20 years, some contagion comes into our society. Their first answer is vaccines, vaccines. You know, it's the it's kind of the 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 
the ultimate brilliance of marketing by the pharmaceutical industry to get us thinking that vaccines are the answer. Now, this is the same marketing that went on 50 years ago with antibiotics. Uh, we thought that antibiotics would be the answer to all bacterial infection. And what we found is the abuse of antibiotics... Uh, giving it just almost for colds and, and just for no reasons, has now developed strains that antibiotics don't work. And so all of a sudden we are losing the battle with infection and people are dying from infection that most probably never would have died if we only gave antibiotics to the rare exception. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics, or I would like to call them the American Academy of Pharmaceuticals, you know, um, uh, they said for children, the only time you should give uh, antibiotics for pneumonia if it's life-threatening. I couldn't believe that they made that statement a few years ago because we know that pediatricians hand out antibiotics like water, um, and, and they don't do it in only life-threatening situations. And, and there they go again, the state playing God, assuming they know so much about life. It's just it, it's, it's comparable to when they discovered DNA and assumed 96% of it was junk, uh, that they would know all the ins and outs of, of the system. You've got the probiotic systems and the gut flora, that's proven so important in, in conjunction with vaccine studies and a whole lot more. I mean, uh, let, let's go back to Benjamin Rush, who warned that if they didn't put medical freedom in the Constitution, uh, we would have medical tyranny. And, and that's what's coming now with Obamacare, you know, uh, uh, exactly that. I mean, it's just uh, uh, I, I find it incredulous that anyone would vote on a 1,100-page bill without reading it. I mean, uh, I, I find this just unconscionable. You know, every single person who voted for something like that, I don't care what, should be thrown out. I mean, end of story. You know, uh, I can't believe it. You know, and that's become, uh, you know, the, the, there's only one time in history that this happened where someone uh, uh, accepted something before they uh, read it, and that was when the Jews were at Mount Sinai, and, and the legend goes that God offered the Torah to many nations and he said we kind of like to see what's in it before we decide to accept it and when he came to Moses and Moses is a sharp guy he said no 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 no. we will agree to it then we'll read what's in it <laughs> so I suppose if you're doing something like that it's worthwhile you know but short of that I, I can't see the, uh, the the value to it yeah but now now it's almost commonplace uh, similar things happen with patriarchs one and two and I guess it's just a new thing in Congress not to read the uh, text that you're passing into law. Yeah, exactly. And 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 uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of evil. I mean, I'd love to believe there's no evil in this world. But what happens in all these acts, they have little things hidden into the uh, into the uh, thousands of pages of these bills, which are, and, and in fact, in Obamacare, they actually have in there that if you don't vaccinate your child, the enforcement bodies, the uh, um, the child and family services can come to your house and forcibly take your children away. Frightening, absolutely frightening. You know, just the idea, I mean, this is America. I mean, what's what's wrong with these people? Why would they, there's, they have no interest in protecting the people. You know, uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's very, very sad. And I, I don't even know what the answer is, but as long as your voice is there and Alex's voice is there, you know, um, as long as our flames are flickering a little bit, we can become a roaring fire. And I think when it comes to the vaccine issue, we're becoming a roaring fire. Well, doctor, let's talk about that, too, because you had the case in California where they at least attempted to go door to door and force vaccinate uh, students they were calling truant. Uh, you've got the cases where pediatricians are refusing patients who won't vaccinate. Uh, you've got the case. We had the person on the show last week. I hope I didn't butcher her name, Patricia Finn. She was a lawyer representing parents who wouldn't vaccinate. And they tried to threaten her with taking away her uh, bar agreements and tried to get her clients list. Yeah, let me tell you something. You know, I, I've I've spoken to her. I haven't spoken to her recently, but I'm very proud of her. I mean, uh, she suffers from one thing. She's too attractive, and that really gets riles the uh, the le the left wing, you know, because they believe that pretty women don't have a place in uh, uh, in in business, you know, and 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 uh, and she's fabulous. I mean, she refuses to give up the names of those families who owe her clients. And my God, that's one of the absolutely protected concepts of a lawyer. You know, the the the, the uh, lawyer 
uh, uh, client confidentiality. And it's just, uh, um, it's sinful what they're trying to do. And then I will do anything I can to help her, you know. And, uh, and But there's a growing number of lawyers like that. And that's what's so exciting, you know. Uh, but I tell you, California is so fascinating. California is one of the 18 states that allows for a philosophical exemption. So the idea that they go door to door, if the if the families know the law, and all they have to do is hand that person, I would not let them get in the house. You just slide through the paper, through the, the opening of your door, your philosophical uh, exemption. And I think that's kind of really, really important, you know, uh, in California right now. You don't even, and that that's one that's, you know, so th- that's why it's funny how they're going from, it, unfortunately, many of us don't know our rights, but even better, uh, uh, if you have someone knock on your door, you slide them a card and tell them that I'm, I'm going to have my attorney call you. That, that's, that's uh, um, I, I think, the most important thing. And I've, I've spoken to many, many of these, and I feel bad for the people who are enforcing it. They aren't bad people. It's just a job to them. You know, and usually when I talk to them, you know, that usually resolves it way before it gets past any type of issue. Uh, let me bring this up, shifting gears. You've got David Rockefeller, his family, among other things, really obsessed with the population issue over the past century. And he gave that speech uh, in 1995, basically showing what you showed on the chart, that the decline in diseases ha- has kind of contributed to the explosion of population, suggesting that it's almost uh, a negligible thing, uh, a negative thing, I mean, that so many people are living now that the birth rate, uh, excuse me, the infant mortality rate has dropped, and thus they are pushing vaccines worldwide, globally, with people like the Gates Foundation. Uh, how do we combat that agenda? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, I tell you how we combat it. We just go back to Genesis right in the beginning, and the world wasn't big enough for Cain and Abel. You know, uh, the two of them couldn't survive together. And so uh, I, I think we've had these problems of uh, of the world is, is, too, is too small for a long, long time. But on a more serious uh, note, uh, these are evil people. Now, I don't mind. Tell them, every one of them, to exercise birth control and have no family. That's fine with me. I have no problem with that. You know, uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the I, I remember when I first got married 40 years ago, uh, in the uh, early, in the late 60s, there was this talk about ZPG, zero, um, uh, uh, zero uh, population uh, pe- growth. Population growth. Thank you. You know, and. Uh, let me tell you, we're 40 years later. You know, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, it, it's just incredible. You know, it, it's, it's a, um, it, it's frightening. I mean, uh, the, these are the, the one world uh, alliance that uh, uh, they want you to, uh, uh, you know, I tell you, I'll give you a perfect example. Like uh, uh, Buffett, who talks about uh, uh, rich people should pay more taxes. I don't see him paying more taxes. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's like. They're telling you what you should do. I, it's no different. You know, you know, get out of my life. You know, hey, get a life yourself. You know, uh, um, and, and I think that that's, uh, uh, these are evil people, you know, uh, uh, and, and, um, and how do we combat it? By just, uh, saying no. We're not going to do that. You know, I think that's the the way to combat it. You know, uh, I, I I find it just kind of really uh, uh, interesting. I mean, uh, they they essentially want unwholesome life, you know. And even now, this whole issue of um, of um, uh, contraception, you know, uh, to be put into uh, uh, Obamacare and and trying to force religious organization to mandate paying for contraception. I tell you why it's so phony. Cost of birth control pills, which I have never dispensed in my life, not because of religious reasons, because they're way too dangerous. Nine dollars a month, nine dollars a month, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and, and so the issue has nothing to do with uh, uh, that it's not available. You know, in fact, it, all the Planned Parenthoods, you know, um, uh, which which give me the creeps, the whole organization, you know. Uh, you can get it free, <laughs> you know, if, if uh, all you have to do is get a pink card or a green card. I don't know what the number you know, is. And so th- this, is a, this is just control. They want control, control, control. Very scary. Yeah, it is. And you were talking about other ways that the government's losing credibility, cases that are being overturned, showing that prominent vaccine critics were proven right or at least not proven wrong. Uh, let's get into a little bit of that and anything else you want to bring up. 
Yeah, thank you. No, that, that's uh, uh, many of you because I know he's been a guest many times uh, with uh, you and Alex. Uh, that's Dr. Andrew Wakefield, um, who wrote a paper in the in 1998 or 1999 on a he saw a connection. He's a prominent uh, gastro uh, pediatric gastroenterologist, which means he deals with issues of the intestines, you know, in children, and he noticed a correlation uh, between children who had regressive autism. Uh, and those who um, had measles, mumps, and rubella virus in their in their intestine, and he surmised that maybe uh, that was one of the causes. And he wrote a paper al- along with a the, one of the most prominent world uh, uh, gastroenterologists, Dr. Walker, and uh, they took Dr. Walker's license away after he had retired already. They took Dr. Wakefield's license away after hearings, and just a couple days ago. Uh, the Lancet, which published the article, retracted the article, and just a couple of days ago, the, the courts in England overturned it and said it was pure bias. There was no evidence of any malfeasance done here. The families who uh, they the, uh, they alleged the committee uh, were upset by the research that was done. Every one of them came in the defense of these doctors. And so, you know, it's kind of very interesting that, you know, um, uh, um, uh, it was just an agenda by someone, maybe the, maybe the drug industry, you know. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's frightening, you know, but it's exciting. This is a very big victory because um, – Dr. Um, Walker must be in his late 70s or early 80s, you know, and uh, he had already retired, so it was more of an, of an a, a, um, for his reputation than anything else. But this bodes very well for Dr. Wakefield, who now has a suit against all the people who brought uh, the suit against him to cause him to lose his license in England. Doctor, it's so important that you're doing this seminar on how to allow people to understand better, to write their own exemptions, to write them from a point where it's going to stand. At the same time, uh, we've got all the stuff going on in government, so much corruption. Even if you just started with the H1N1 vaccine and all the dangerous stuff they allowed to go in there with the false pandemic, at what point does it become a case of criminal negligence? Oh, I think it's 100 percent. I think vaccines are criminal right now. Uh, Let's take the flu vaccine. There's 25 micrograms of mercury. Uh, uh, Mercury is one of the, the, the... if not the most toxic substance known. And it's far, I mean, the president's worried about doing a, a pipeline uh, um, from Canada to bring gas here. He's worried about that, but he's not worried about injecting pregnant women, he, injecting children with a vaccine, the flu vaccine, which by, just doesn't work anyway. But even if it did work, it's got mercury, and every drop of mercury causes neurotoxicity, just a matter of how much. you know. And so we're dealing with with scandalous type of stuff, you know, and that's just one example because the amount of toxins and vaccines. Could, but but look, let's go another way. Let's assume they remove all the toxins from the vaccine. The vaccines themselves don't do any good, and so you know. Uh, uh, it's really, in my side, a losing argument. It's just a matter of time before all of the publics realize that the emperor is wearing no clothes. And once you realize that, you can't go back. Tell us one more time about the webinar you're going to give. And that's in two days from now, correct? Right. It's it's this Sunday night, March 11th, 7 to 8 o'clock at Central Time. And it's going to be a how to write a legal waiver on vaccines. I gave a little bit of the opening right now, but I will go specifically into how to write it. And also I will answer as many questions as I can. All you have to do is you'll type your questions. And to go there, just go to homefirst.com. That's my website, H-O-M-E-F-I-R-S-T.com. And I'll just click on the webinar button and uh, you can... Um, um, you can sign up for it, uh, and or, or you can give our office a call at 866-395-1881. That's 866-395-1881. Doctor, it's very interesting speaking with you, and we appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. You too. And hopefully everyone will check out that webinar. It is important to know where we're coming from and have our bases intact. At any rate, that is it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back again next week.